The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of KSMQ Public Service Media Incorporated or its assigns. Welcome to On Cue. I'm your host, Eric Olson. Our schools have been putting an emphasis on STEM initiatives. That's science, technology, engineering, and math. Austin Public Library is doing the same, and on today's show, we talk with Courtney Wyatt about their latest program for adults. Steve Kime from Vision 2020 is here to talk about what's going on in the Bike Walk Committee. But first, we find out more about the upcoming I-35 construction season that will impact us all in Southern Minnesota. On Cue is next. From KSMQ Television in Austin, this is On Cue, connecting interesting issues and interesting people. On Cue. Interstate 35 carries thousands and thousands of vehicles every day, and it takes a beating. Spring is here, and so is construction season. Mike Doherty from the Minnesota Department of Transportation here to tell us what we can expect when it comes to rerouting, delays, and other traffic plans for the summer. Hi, Mike. Hi, Eric. Well, here you get through winter, and this terrible winter we had with all the highways closing, and it was just one thing after another, and now we come into summertime. So it's time for I-35 to have some facelifts or construction projects. Yep. One of them uh, you've been telling is in the Owatonna area. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it kind of goes with the old joke, Minnesota has two seasons. We have winter and construction season, so um, <laughs> it does fit with that. But I-35, uh, you mentioned the thousands of vehicles that travel. The traffic counts show us about 35,000 per day uh, vehicles that come through mm. that, that stretch in Owatonna. And it is due for a makeover. It's about a $19 million project that's going to take two years. Um, we're going to replace the pavement um, in both lanes as well as replace the bridges that bring traffic over it. Um, the bridges had been put in in 1963, so they were definitely due. And there's some safety improvements given the way traffic has changed in this region has really grown. So there'll be some auxiliary lanes added for people getting on the highway as well as off. And um, this summer, we'll take down the southbound lanes. So traffic headed south will be routed onto the northbound lanes and we'll have single lane head-to-head -head traffic. And that's the thing we're advising people that think about those traffic, uh, heavy traffic use times like weekends, Friday nights, you know, Sundays when people are coming back, um, or commuter time if you live in that area. Um, you are gonna see some delays. There are some detours that will take you around that stretch, uh, but those are on county roads and um, it's more to make sure there's access to local businesses so that they can continue to, to stay open. Yeah, there's really not a, well, I, you're the expert, but I mean, coming south from the cities, that you, you can take 52 for a while, but then, I mean, you're kind of, 35 is, is it, or is there another good way to kind of weave your way around the construction? Not, not through that stretch, and that was the dilemma, is you wanna keep traffic open. It's, it's a huge corridor for commerce um, with traffic coming through there, as well as commuters and just regular motorists. So to keep it open, that's why we stretched it over two years so we could keep one lane of traffic open and then close down the other one. Um, but yeah, there aren't any, any real good uh, auxiliary roads to route that amount of traffic through daily. Um, local traffic, it can handle, but not 35,000 per day. Mm -hmm. Well, and the industrial, you know, the manufacturing folks in Owatonna, there's a bunch of them. Yes. Yeah, and we've really worked um, with the businesses and the industry there because, yeah, you're right, um, Owatonna is just a, a thriving, uh, you know, yeah, Viracon, industry. And all yeah, those, yeah, yeah, the industry, um, it's, a, it's a trade area. Um, so we tried to work with the businesses. We had a special meeting to meet with them to help them understand when the this process was going to take place. Um, it's going to be starting, you know, mid-May, and it's going to stretch into November. And so um, to kind of help them understand when some ramps will be closed, and then that's when the, the detours will happen. Are there new exits, or will it look the same? Uh, you mentioned some extra on-ramps or something like that. Mm -hmm. But like uh, for Highway 14 coming down to Austin, you cut across on 14 and then take 218. Yes. That's probably going to remain the same, or are there yes. other configurations. No, it'll be north of that where that construction actually takes place. So, um, you know, if you do come up 218 um, and on over to 14 and into 35, 
it won't be right at that exit, but just north of there is where it'll start. Okay. Um, so people can kind of factor in. If, if they know, you know, we establish a detour route, but if you know of a better route, um, we advise people to, to take those through Owatonna um, otherwise, but um, just for the general public that maybe isn't um, fully versed in it, we can route people along. Later this summer, though, um, just over by 218, Highway 14 is under, going to undergo um, some construction as well. Um, there's about a two and a half mile stretch. It's going to expand Highway 14 from two lanes to four oh, lanes. Oh, the dangerous area yes. to cut down on the act yeah. crashes, fatal crashes. Yeah, we'd really like to get that whole stretch all the way over to Dodge Center done. Um, this was a small increment. It was part of the Corridors of Commerce program uh, from Governor Dayton. Um, so it's a small stretch, but that's going to start in July. Um, you know, and if you're looking uh, for commuters coming down uh, or heading up to the cities, um, if they go to the Medford uh, outlet malls, um, beginning in July, there will be some work on the roundabouts. They're uh, redoing those, so those ramps will be shut down and folks will be able to get off at Clinton Falls just south of there and take a detour over to the Medford outlet malls. So um, we're meeting with some businesses up there uh, towards the, uh, the end of the month to talk about the detours there and, and just how they can work with uh, the traffic plans. Speaking of roundabouts, that's been a uh, <coughs> kind of a change and I suppose there are some folks wondering is that just a fad or a flash in the pan because mm -hmm. they're kind of different taking on a model of, of Europe but it was always about safety and you're telling me Michael before we went on that there's actually a record now to look upon to show that they are safer. Yeah, that's what we're seeing thus far. You know, they, um, the folks that like to study it, they like a longer stretch of time. But, uh, you know, we say it's, it's a preliminary uh, indications, but um, there's one north of Rochester that was put in on a busy stretch of Highway 63, and that's been open for about 14, 15 months, and there's only been one minor crash there. Historically, that had had um, five crashes per year, and I do remember a few years ago where there was a school bus that was was struck when someone tried to get out. So um, thus far, we've we've received good feedback, and it's really the safety measure because instead of a there's not the right angle crashes anymore. If if there is a crash, it's sort of a side swipe. It minimizes the chance for serious injury or, or death. What about some other greatest hits? Uh, you got a couple, two, three other ones for summer we road do. construction we besides do. Highway 35. Yeah, um, you know if you're if you're heading east, if you're going on I-90. Um, you'll encounter um, several uh, repaving projects probably beginning um, late May into July um, over by Stewartville. There'll okay. be a stretch and it'll be the eastbound lanes so you'll be routed um, into Past the, the Rochester exit if you're past. going east? Yes, okay. yep. There'll be a stretch there and then there's a 12 mile stretch over near Winona that's also getting some attention in the eastbound lanes and so um, that's a good thing but then you will be uh, routed over into the westbound lanes and there'll be head-to-head -head traffic so depending on the time of day you may encounter some delays. Um, if you're going further east um, folks may recall that we started the Dresbach Bridge project I-90 over the Mississippi into La Crosse. That continues this summer and um, yeah, that's going to be closed. Well or no? Nope the bridge will still be open it'll be um, narrowed to head-to-head uh, -head traffic. Um, when you're coming back west if you wanted to go south into Dresbach, we'll close the ramp there. Um, the biggest thing, though, is, is that Dresbach rest area. That will close up um, and be closed until 2016, okay. just for construction safety. So um, that's significant there. Um, if folks travel on Highway 52 uh, around the Cannon Falls area, they'll uh, encounter. There's been a, a dangerous intersection just south of Cannon Falls. We're putting an overpass with a, a quadrant interchange, so um, that should minimize the crashes there. Um, but that's starting up um, in May here, and do you do you have these all listed on your on a website somewhere? Yes, and I can get you. Uh, you know, there's a website that has all the construction projects, um, and it's fantastic because you can click on each project and sign up for um, a uh, direct contact email. So anytime we update things with detours, um, if you've signed up, you can get an email about that specific project. Oh. So, yeah, it's really handy. We really try to reach folks with the electronics as well, you know, um, what's more convenient with them rather than visiting a website constantly, hopefully they can get the updates there. Um, it like worked for the storms this winter as far as seeing when the, what <coughs> roads were closed and, and when. It seemed like they were kept pretty up to date, which yes. is amazing with 
the weather. It's like breaking news, you know, when weather it was. is closing roads and such. Yeah, yeah, and, and that 511minnesota.org uh, map, that also has the construction um, uh, components put in there. So if you go to look at it, even in the summer, you know, most folks look in the winter for weather conditions and road conditions, but in the summer it will have any indications of road construction, if there are delays expected, if there's a closure, that sort of thing. So people can tra plan their trip ahead of time. And I know, uh, you may not be aware, but I know the folks at Austin Vision 2020 are working hard with others within MnDOT to beautify yes. the uh, off-ramps, uh, the whole look. Yes, the facades on them, yes, right. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's been a fantastic project. I talked with the folks at MnDOT and they were very excited about the, the chance to work with Vision 2020 and just the, they remarked that the energy and the, the interest in um, Austin and what's going on here and, and I was familiar with the project but it was kind of neat to see some folks discover just what, what you guys already know uh, is an exciting project. So it's five, what is the website again? Five? 511mn.org and that's the overall, that's the, the road map and that'll okay. show you everything. Um, if you go to MnDOT's website you can click on our region and uh, get a, uh, a construction map. All right, very interesting. Thanks very much, Mike, for uh, joining us and keeping us abreast of all the uh, traffic. We don't want to say delays, don't want to say problems, but uh, repair projects. Yes, <laughs> in the end, it's a good thing. That's right, very yep. good. Yep. All right, Mike Doherty, District Public Affairs and Community Relations for MnDOT. Thank you for joining us. And stay with us now, Courtney Wyant from the Austin Public Library is coming up next. You can watch On Cue anytime by visiting the KSMQ TV website, ksmq.org. And welcome back. The Austin Public Library uh, coming up this summer has a very interesting idea. And it's not really about libraries. It's about easing people back into science. If you were afraid of science, as I was as a school student, uh, we want you to be part of this Austin Public Library experiment. It's the first year. Courtney Wyant's here from the library to tell us more about Pushing the Limits. Welcome. Thank you. And this is a new program that the National Science Foundation is funding. And as I understand it, Austin Public Library was one of just a few in the country to get selected. Tell us a little bit about this. We were. The Pushing Limits program um, was opened up to uh, 75 libraries nationwide. And we were chosen as one of the libraries um, to run this uh, discussion. Really what it's about is um, uh, informal science learning for adults. Um, they've noticed a lack of adults learning about science. Um, a lot of programs are geared more towards children, and so it was actually professors from Dartmouth and a group of librarians that developed this program. And is it just reading books, and then uh, is it sort of like uh, a book club or something where people read and then get together and just talk about it, or is it a little more structured? What's the system like? Sure, it is based sort of similar to a book club um, where you read the book that's at hand, but more they're trying to do like a topical science-based discussion. So you could have read a segment of the book. Um, we know They know that adults are pretty busy, so they try to keep it more topical based. Um, it's paired with two, um, two videos that come with it. One is the author who discuss what sort of science they may have used because they may have not had a science background. The book could be a fiction or a nonfiction piece. So they're kind of discussing what sort of science was I thinking of when I developed this book. And then the second part is another um, video that's about everyday people that may be using that science and how it's used in everyday life. Okay, so it's like taking a piece of literature or a book and delving into the science of it. 
yep. a little bit, and you brought one along. Now I know that author, Clive Cussler. He it's non or it's fiction, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was asking you before we went on the air, what what is a fiction book doing in a science? but a uh, science course, but it's kind of to ease folks into science. Sure it is, because um, they have figured people, you read the newspaper every day, and there may be some kind of uh, particular thing in your local part of of the world that is there's something science going on and there and a lot of people read about it but this is um, supposed to get kind of community together where we can talk about the local like how this might um, tie in locally to you okay and you're bringing uh, I don't want to say teachers maybe they're they are all teachers but you're bringing professionals in to sort of lead the discussions we are we have partnered um, with the Nature Center and so a lot of our discussions are with Larry Dolphin and some of the Nature Center employees. And they have um, come in because they have a lot of the local of survival and nature um, backgrounds that we are discussing in these books that they can tie in um, some of their local um, history and their knowledge of what's going on in our environment. And you just picked Larry because he does a good owl imitation. Have you ever yep, heard yep. of him? Is that, is that why he got the job? <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, uh, just kidding, Larry, but I know you do a great uh, owl interpretation there, imitation. Uh, you're, you're kind of doing a lot of different things that, and when I say you, I mean the Austin Public Library, that one wouldn't necessarily consider what a library, quote unquote, does, cooking classes. Uh, I know you've been active in helping young people download music uh, songs out of the internet. These are kind of different ideas that I would think of for a library. That is true. Um, I think the role of the library is, has changed quite a bit. It's not just a place for book resources, but it's becoming a community center, and that's what we're trying to build, a partnership with other local organizations, and then also a center where people can combine and meet with one another. Like our cooking classes have been a great success in that sense, um, that we have people who are new to town, people who have lived in town for quite a while, and picking a uh, topic or uh, something uh, more of a broader range of something, we can pull in more people and it's become more of this community center. And then from there we can give them the resources. If you're interested in more reading, we have more books. Uh, we could have more discussions, we could meet more. So it's kind of been um, a great opening in that sense to have the science grant and also the um, healthy food grant. Yeah, this is a $2,500 grant from the National Science Foundation. And so will you be, uh, do you test people? How, how do you show that uh, people enjoyed it or learned something? We do. Um, most of the time we like to um, have some informal surveys. Um, with some grants they do want surveys. And then other things that I've had while I've been helping with our cooking class before is people later coming up or calling or emailing me and sharing about um, what they liked or what they didn't like, and I kind of like that openness of having that one-on-one -on -one with people. Then you can kind of from there gauge how well is this working for my community, or how can I change my next, um, they, they keep, uh, grants keep a lot of things open, so maybe I could change something that would maybe work better knowing my community and my audience. Uh, we're speaking with Courtney Wyant from the Austin Public Library about the Pushing the Limits program, a new summertime program. Well, four months. Can people just, it's, it's on one night or one day? Do they have to register? Yep, we have it for one evening, um, once a month. It runs from 6 to about 8 o'clock. Um, we have refreshments and food that we offer. So the first beginning is a little bit of socializing and getting to know some people in your groups. And then we start the talk at about 6.30. They can log on to the website or call the library or even stop in and sign up for it. Okay. And, and there's any number of people or are you holding it to certain numbers? We did keep it at about between 20 and 25 with the grant. They did um, give us books that we actually give the book to the patron to, to keep. And adults keep. pretty much only? That's who you're trying to target here or students? Who we do have a, adults but it is open to if teens are interested in science, um, um, college students are interested in science, so it's a wide range of um, who would like to come to it. You've had one already mm -hmm. as I understand. How'd that go? 
It went really well. We actually, um, speaking of age levels, we had um, someone f um, right out of college who had missed being in college and wanted to come and discuss. Wait, they missed being, being in college? <laughs> yes. And they were very excited to have um, some sort of uh, science-based discussion okay. going on. And then we've had, uh, you know, up to uh, retired citizens that haven't had science since probably um, high school. So it's been a wide range of audience, and we were very successful in, we had 20 participants, and half of them were male. So we were split down the middle of male and female. So call the library to sign up or website, yep. or your website, yep. either of those two alternatives. Um, and I've seen you at the library. How did you become interested in, in library science? Just curious. Sure. Well, it's been a very long <laughs> hall of education. I actually have a master's in museum studies. Um, and a background in archaeology, and that's what I started my schooling in. And then from there, I've always loved old books and reading. I ended up um, doing a master's now in library science and started at the Austin Public Library wow. about a year ago. Oh, yeah. okay. So this is like your first foray into something that you learned in graduate school. It is, it is. And, and being an adult service librarian is a new role. It used to be just reference or information, but now they're finding as they're gearing into more of a community-based center that they're really lacking in programs for adults. So this is a pretty new role in the Austin Library itself and in libraries in general. Boy, that's, uh, that's great foresight because you have to stay relevant. Mm -hmm. Courtney Wyatt, thank you so much thank for joining you. us. And again, folks, uh, call the library or look on their website. Their website address is long. <laughs> I would just go into a search engine and type Austin, Minnesota Public Library uh, and check out the information there. Thanks again for, for being here. Uh, we will be right back with our Vision 2020 update on Q continues right after this. Queue up your own comments for On Q and send them to us at onq at ksmq.org. On Q's Vision 2020 segment is brought to you by Hormel Foundation, Games People Play, and Turtle Creek Estates. And welcome back. Time now for our Vision 2020 update. Steve Kime joins us now from the Bikes Hiking. A uh, bike walk committee. I want to get that right. That Welcome is back. correct. That's right. Correct. And tis the season. Time to bike. Time to walk. Very uh, much so. Yes. Your uh, committee is busy trying to make sure people are safe when they're doing those things. Safety uh, from the start has been one of our number one uh, focus of one of uh, the things we want to really uh, promote. And uh, with that, uh, we have our annual bike safety day. And it is an opportunity for uh, kids and adults to get uh, helmets uh, and, uh, and locks for their bikes. And, and you can so, check the website for information Absolutely, on that. absolutely. And uh, yeah, it's a great time for the kids to uh, practice their skills. We have a little course set up. Um, and uh, for a minimal copay, they can get a brand new helmet, hey. which is very, uh, very good. We're really trying to uh, keep safety in the, in the forefront. And I know that uh, there's a hopeful that some of the trails in the area will connect with one another. The bike trails are expanding. That is absolutely correct. That's another one of our uh, goals or uh, objectives over the course of our, our uh, work here. Um, hopefully in the very near future, we'll, have, we'll see that extension uh, of the Shooting Star Trail to Austin from Rose Creek. So that would be a huge plus, I think. Uh, and then does that connect all over the place after that, from Rose Creek East? Yes, Rose, you'll be able to ride all the way to Leroy to the State Park, uh, which is a really nice, uh, uh, you know, uh, plus for, for Austin, I think. Uh, so that part's already there, the Rose Creek, Creek to, to the, uh, Leroy is done. Okay, yes. so it's the little bit, it's Rose Creek to Austin. That segment is, le is all that's left to do. And I say all that's left to do, but it's a, <laughs> it's a project, so uh, yes. Is it getting right of way and that kind of stuff? Or are you still Correct. We have, we have the route, we have the, uh, everything in place. We need funding. So uh, there is a, uh, hopefully this year, uh, with the House and uh, Minnesota Senate and the governor's approval, 
we will get our uh, funding for that trail. That's our, we're keeping our fingers crossed for that. And that's how long is it? It's that's about 11 miles total needed for that, was to finish that trail. Former railroad or? Part of it was, part of it was, part of it goes along, uh, right away along inter or, uh, Highway 56. Oh, sure. Uh, okay. Coming north, and then uh, part of it goes along uh, uh, County Road 58, if everybody's familiar with kind of the layout of the roads out there. Um, and then into Austin out by uh, 28th Street. And you also have a bike tour coming up uh, through community education. Talk a little bit about that. We do. It's, uh, it's an opportunity. Well, what we found out is a lot of the residents of Austin aren't familiar with all of the trails that we have in town. And a matter of fact, we have 14 miles of beautiful trails in the city. And a lot of people might be familiar with uh, the Mill Pond, you know, and see that all the time, but um, aren't aware of the many miles of trails that go beyond that. So we are offering, uh, through Community Ed, uh, a ride and uh, that will uh, just introduce people uh, to the trail and take a tour and maybe have some refreshments afterwards. Um, just hopefully get people out to enjoy our trail system. Weekly or a one-time thing or what? It's going to be coming uh, up uh, this uh, spring summer and then uh, hopefully we can make it a you know a more annual event i'll say yes wonderful yes steve kind thank you so much thank you very much for having me good luck on shooting star hopefully you'll get that funding thank you very much and that'll do it for this edition of on cue i'm eric olson see you again next time Q is a production of KSMQ Television in Austin, nonprofit public television.